Hola amigos, buenas tardes y bienvenidos a esta transmisión. Hoy es la última de las charlas de nuestro ciclo de diálogo astronómico y no veo cómo podríamos haber cerrado de una mejor manera. Hoy tenemos el honor, el gran honor de contar con editor senior Kelly Betty de la revista Sky and Telescope, tal vez la revista más importante de astronomía en el planeta. Y te voy a platicar un poquito acerca del ponente del día de hoy. Él es licenciado en Geología por el Instituto de Tecnología de California, sí, Caltech, y tiene una maestría en Periodismo Científico por la Universidad de Boston. Kelly se ha especializado en Ciencia Planetaria y Exploración Espacial. Él eh, editó The New Solar System, considerado una referencia estándar, como sabes, entre los científicos planetarios. Algo también muy interesante es que ha sido honrado dos veces por la División de Ciencias Planetarias de la Sociedad Americana de Astronomía. Escribió el premio de la Liga Astronómica y ha sido también galardonado por la Unión Geofísica Estadounidense al logro sostenido en el periodismo científico. Y una nota de última hora, nos, nos están avisando que de hecho hay un asteroide nombrado precisamente en su honor. Damas y caballeros, por favor, acompáñenme a recibir a Kelly Betty. Kelly Betty, it's quite an honor to have you here. Thank you, Cuauhtémoc. Uh, hola, amigos. It's my pleasure to be here this evening, and I hope you enjoy this presentation about Mars. Okay, and uh, actually, we will eventually. We prepared something with Spanish. Preparamos esta presentación con títulos en español para que pueda ser del deleite de todos ustedes. Y al final de ella contaremos con la presencia de Kelly para contestar algunas de sus preguntas. ¡Vámonos! Hola amigos, me llamo Kelly Beatty, and I'm very happy to be with you today. I'm going to be talking about the planet Mars, the red planet Mars, and its history, and what we know about it, and how our spacecraft are teaching us more about it every day. I'm going to share my screen now. And uh, start my presentation as soon as I can. I must have picked the wrong one. Hold on. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, great. Vamanos. Okay, so we're going to be talking about Mars uh, in, and, and its, its comparison with Earth. So first, Mars is a planet like our Earth that orbits near the sun. It is about half the diameter of the Earth. And although that is small, remember that Earth is covered three quarters of its surface in water. So the surface of Mars is just about equal to the dry land on the Earth. And also Mars has a day, the time it takes to spin, that is only 24 hours and 40 minutes, almost exactly the same as Earth. Its, its rotation is tipped to one side like the Earth's is. It has seasons. It has an atmosphere. It's a thin atmosphere. In many ways, Mars is very much like the Earth, but it's a simple planet. It's not as complicated as Earth. And so we think scientifically, if we can understand Mars, we'll know more about the Earth. This is the appearance of Mars through a good backyard telescope. Now, Mars is not visible in our sky right now. It's on the opposite side of the sun in the solar system. So the sun is blocking our view. But when Mars comes very close to the Earth, then we can see some detail on its surface. And these details are tantalizing. It has bright and dark markings. It has a white cap at its pole that is frozen ice. We now know that the ice is frozen carbon dioxide, what we call dry ice. But the, the, through a telescope like I would use or you would use, the, these markings are vague. If we use the Hubble Space Telescope, we get a much better view of Mars. And I'm going to let this image spin so that you can see all of the bright and dark areas on the planet. For many, many decades, we had no idea what caused these bright and dark markings. 
But you can see the small cap down at the South Pole. And you can see that bright circle. I will be talking about that in a second. Now, before the invention of the telescope, Mars was just a point of light in the sky. But as telescopes got better, we got to see it with more and more detail. In the 18, late 1800s, these two astronomers used their telescopes to try to see as much detail on Mars as possible when it came very close to the Earth. And because it was close to the Earth, it looked bigger in the telescope and you could see more detail. Percival Lowell, the astronomer on the right, is from the United States. And Giovanni Schiaparelli is, was from Italy. And Schiaparelli had described features on the surface of Mars that he called canali, which is um, a word that means uh, channels in Italian, but it was mis translated as canals on the Earth. So they both observed Mars during a special time when the two planets were very close together. This diagram shows the orbit of Earth in blue and the orbit of Mars in orange. Earth's orbit is almost a pure circle, but Mars is very lopsided. And sometimes here where it says P, Mars and the Earth can be very close to each other in space. And it was at this situation in the late 1800s that Schiaparelli and Lowell did their closest observations of Mars, just like this, when they come close together. And so Schiaparelli used his telescope to, you know, there was no photography. So any anything that he saw, he had to make a sketch. And you can see, that he has described a very complex system with lots of straight lines and connections. And these are the canali that he described. Percival Lowell also saw what he thought were these straight lines on Mars. And these are his, photo, his sketches taken with a telescope in Arizona that he had constructed just for the purpose of observing Mars. Now, no one else had seen these straight lines before, and they, they suggested that something was uh, like a, a system of highways on the planet. And so this notion that there were these straight lines, canals, places that had been built by some kind of intelligence was very popular in the late 1800s. Here's another map showing them. And this is a, a painting that suggests what these canals might have been like. The idea was that maybe there are creatures on Mars, Martians, who have very limited water supplies, like much of North America right now. And so to, to make it possible to live, they would build these canals that drew water off of the melting polar caps and carried it to the equatorial regions to grow crops. Well, this was a very popular idea. And so by the, by the year 1900, many people believed that Mars was inhabited by uh, intelligent, uh, industrious civilization. And the, the French Academy of Sciences offered a huge amount of money for any scientist who could successfully uh, establish communication with Mars, with this Martian civilization, uh, with, with any civilization, except for Mars, because it was assumed that the Martians were so close to us that it would be too easy to start communication. Of course, we know now that that really isn't true. And I'm going to show you, these are the actual photographs taken uh, a little bit later, uh, more than a century ago, with that same telescope at Lowell Observatory. And you can see the markings there. In the time that these photographs were taken, you had to look at each individual image. But with current technology, we can take all of these images and combine them electronically. And when we do that, the information, the detail becomes much more apparent, much crisper. And so for example, 
Here on the left is one of the drawings that Percival Lowell made of a particular side of Mars. And then here, using this modern technique, is the combination of all the photographs. And you can see that there are some features like this arc here and this arc here that are the same. Uh, and so maybe Lowell was seeing something after all. Here's another example of that. And you can see how the sketch on the left looks an awful lot like the actual photograph on the right. Okay, that was the extent of what we could determine about Mars until the era of spacecraft. And the first spacecraft to fly past Mars at close range and take images was in 1965. It was an American spacecraft called Mariner 4. We had hoped to find a planet that maybe had, you know, plants and green areas and, and puddles of uh, lakes of water. But Mariner 4's photographs showed a very bleak uh, and, and, and uh, harsh terrain with lots of craters. It looked a lot like the moon. Now, the interesting thing, I want you to notice this date, July 14th, 1965. This was the first uh, close-up photographs of a of another planet in our solar system. And 50 years later, exactly, on July 14th of 2015, NASA's spacecraft called New Horizons went past Pluto exactly 15, 50 years later. It's quite an amazing coincidence. So the next spacecraft to go past Mars was in 1969. And it once again showed a very cratered uh, uh, a kind of uh, not pretty environment. This is not a place that we expected life to be able to exist. It wasn't until the year um, uh, 1971 that we were able to reach Mars with our first spacecraft that actually went into orbit around the planet. But something very unusual happened in that year. These are two photographs of the planet Mars in 2001, 20 years ago. And Mars does have a thin atmosphere. And when Mars gets very close to the sun, the atmosphere gets very active and it causes dust from the surface to be carried to great altitudes within the atmosphere. And that, that dust creates a kind of blanket that makes it difficult to see the surface. And just this phenomenon, just this kind of dust storm happened in 1971. And so when our spacecraft arrived, it was called Mariner 9, it couldn't see very much at all. The whole planet was like a cloud of dust. And as the clouds slowly settled, we began to see detail poking up through the clouds. This was one of the first features seen as the dust from that cloud started to, to settle back onto the surface. It's a cluster of craters, but it didn't make any sense to the scientists because these craters would have to be very high above the surface. How is that possible? Later on, as the dust settled, we found that there are places on Mars that have these interconnected um, uh, depressions that look like uh, uh, river networks. And in fact, they are places where water has flowed on the surface of Mars in the distant past different kinds of rivers, all kinds of interesting detail that told scientists that Mars must have had water on its surface in the long ago time. Not now. Right now, Mars is very cold. Any water on its surface would be frozen. But maybe two billion years ago or three billion years ago, early in the history of Mars, the planet was warm enough for liquid water to flow across its surface. Here's another example. All these were amazing discoveries, and they were very surprising. Well, as the clouds settled, as the dust settled, uh, we got a very good uh, idea of what the surface looked like. And it turns out that that cluster of craters was right here on top of a mountain. And that mountain is called Olympus Mons. You can see the craters there. This happens on the Earth as well, on the top of a volcano. Sometimes the throat of the volcano collapses and creates a crater at the top. We call this a caldera. 
And this is what apparently happened on Mars. This enormous volcano has a caldera, a very complex caldera at its top. This volcano is very, very large. The outline that you see is the state of Arizona in the United States, which is a very large state. This volcano is more than 400 miles, 600 kilometers across at its base. And it stretches into the sky for, uh, I'm trying to do the math in my head, uh, approximately 40 kilometers, 25 miles. Now, another feature on Mars that we could see from Earth but didn't know what it was is this bright yellow circle called Hellas Planitia. And it wasn't until we were able to fly by spacecraft that we realized that Hellas is a big depression. It's essentially a giant crater on the surface of Mars that is full of sand. And this crater, there is a, a, a sketch of the United States for comparison. Mexico is down here, and Canada is up here, and this basin would stretch from the border with Canada to the border with Mexico. It's an enormous, it is formed when an asteroid struck Mars in its history very long ago and created this enormous crater. It is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, impact craters in our solar system. Here's another interesting feature on the surface of Mars. Here near its equator is an interconnected set of canyons. Together they are called Valles Marineris. And these canyons are uh, very big, very deep, and very wide. Here is just a small portion of that canyon system. Overall, it's about 4,000 kilometers long, 200 kilometers wide, and uh, 12 or 13 kilometers deep. And here is a little map of the Grand Canyon in the United States at the same scale. But this picture that you see here is not the whole Valles Marineris. It's just a small part of it. It's truly an enormous feature. One of the things we discovered about Mars is that uh, this, this map of, is of the planet Mars. Here is Hellas down here, purple. The colors represent the altitude above sea level, if you will. The blues are very low, and the reds, browns, and whites are very high. You can see the scale up here at the upper right corner. And what I want you to notice is that here's the equator right here in the middle, and, and south of the equator, the surface of Mars is generally very high. There are many, many craters that you can see there. But north of the equator, there are not very many craters, and the surface is very low. And if you reprojected that map so that you're looking down on the North Pole, this is what it would look like. Now, many scientists have wondered about this, and they wonder if this blue area perhaps represents the edge of what at one time was a giant body of water on the surface of Mars, a, a giant ocean. Maybe. But instead, it might mark where an even bigger impact took place. Uh, we, we don't know when this happened or even if it happened. But it has a name. It's called the crater. The basin is called Utopia. And this is a, a set of rings that could be where the original crater was on the surface. This is an artist drawing of what that impact might have looked like very early in the history of Mars. Another painting by an artist of what the impact might have looked like. And we cannot know for sure whether this actually happened. But if it did, it changed the surface of Mars for all time. Now, we have spacecraft that have studied Mars, and, and we know from those uh, observations that the, the, the crust of Mars, the outer layer of the planet, is not the same everywhere. In the north, it's much thinner. And in the south, where all the craters are, it's much thicker. This is an indication that maybe the crater did occur, because it would tend to uh, remove material from the north part of the planet and dump it onto the south part. 
Now, there are other parts of Mars that are very interesting. This is, I mentioned this polar cap, this uh, uh, big deposit of ice at the South Pole. This is a cap that is, uh, consists of uh, this frozen carbon dioxide, but also frozen water. And in fact, about two years or two or three years ago, uh, we, are, we have spacecraft in orbit around Mars that use radar to penetrate the surface of Mars to see what is underground. And that radar, you can see one of the radar maps here on the right, it's near the polar cap on the South Pole. Uh, that radar made some observations that suggested maybe there is a lake buried beneath the surface of Mars. So this is a side view. Here is the surface of Mars, and we're kind of looking at it sideways. And the idea was that maybe very deep there was a, 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 a buried lake with liquid water in it. But we now realize that there is no water there. The the that that part of Mars would be too cold for liquid water to exist. It must be frozen. And in fact, we think it's a combination of a frozen ice and maybe some frozen uh, rocky material. That is, it, in a sense, it fooled the radar into thinking that it was water, but it was not. And yet there is a lot of water buried on Mars. This is another map. And the blue on this map uh, is an indication of where there is ice not on the surface of Mars, but buried below the surface, not very far down, just a few meters. And you can see that the water is very, uh, it's very easily and, and very widespread around the South Pole, not so much around the North Pole, but it's, it's there. And so we know that there is a lot of water on Mars and that this water must have been a liquid at some point in its past. Uh, we don't know what happened to all that water. One other thing I want to mention before we go on is that Mars has two small satellites. Uh, one is called Phobos, the larger one, and you can see they're not very large. The other is Deimos. There is some, there is a debate whether these are little satellites that were created with Mars or were they captured by Mars, say, as asteroids from the asteroid belt? And I have a, I have a discussion here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, kind of zip through this quickly. They, the, both of these moons are much closer to Mars than our moon is to the Earth. And you know, it takes our moon about 30 days, 29 and a half days, to go completely around our planet from new moon to new moon. But on Mars, both of its moons go around in just hours, just eight hours for Phobos and, and 30 hours for Deimos. Okay, I'm gonna skip through this because uh, it's, it's just a little bit complicated, but <clears throat> the, the, the gravity pull of Mars on Phobos is such that someday, maybe a billion years from now, Phobos will get closer and closer to Mars and eventually crash into its surface. That is, what the, that is what the physics is saying. Now I have here just a few pictures that I like of the surface of Mars that show you some of the beauty of the planet Mars. We have spacecraft that have taken amazing photographs of the surface of Mars. Imagine photographs that you see of Earth. We also have these beautiful photographs of Mars. This is a set of layers near the South Pole. Over time, the, the climate of Mars gets colder and warmer and colder and warmer, and the dust in the atmosphere builds up layers, almost like rings of a tree in the surface. And this is one of those images. These are sand dunes that are moving across the surface of Mars. It is a dark colored sand uh, that is, uh, these, these sand dunes are active today. They are being blown by the winds on Mars. And in fact, here is an interesting photograph that was recorded by a spacecraft. Here on the left, uh, covered in white, is a high is a high plateau, and on the on the right of the picture is a low valley. So this is a steep slope, and what you see here is a cloud of a landslide caught in the act, captured as it was happening by one of our spacecraft. 
Here's another interesting picture. Mars has uh, little whirlwinds on its surface in the atmosphere called dust devils. And here is a dust devil photographed by a spacecraft. And this is the, the dust. This looks like it could be the shadow of this dust devil, but it's not. It's actually because you, if you look closely, they are not the same shape. This dark area is the place along the surface of Mars where the winds have scoured the surface and revealed dark rock underneath. Here's another set of interesting features on Mars. These are gullies on the side of a crater. And it looks like that there was water trickling down in the bottoms of these gullies. In some places, this water probably is coming out from inside Mars and trickling down in the summertime. Or maybe it's some other process. Maybe it's rocks that are uh, rolling down the hills and, and creating these gullies. Now, when Mariner 9 circled Mars, it discovered a lot of amazing features. And one is this little feature right here with the box around it. It is, it is in the region of Mars called Sidonia. And when I enlarge it, it looks like this. And at the time, this is now 50 years ago, the scientists looked at that and said, ha, look, it looks like a human face. It is a rock formation that looks like a human face. But a lot of people believe that it actually was a carving, a statue, if you will, carved into the surface of Mars to look like a human face. It was a signal from the Martian civilization to the planet Earth, to us here on Earth. Somehow they knew that humans had two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. I'm not sure how they discovered that. And there was a, there was a lot of controversy about this feature. It's called the Cydonia face. Now, since that time, we've sent other spacecraft to Mars that can photograph it in much better detail. And it turns out that the face is not a face at all. It's a large plateau that has been heavily eroded by wind and water. You see it there on the left. And when the sun strikes it just right, you get this appearance here that we see in, in the picture from 1971. Kind of a funny story. OK, so we have sent many in that in the last 50 years, we have sent dozens of spacecraft to Mars. NASA has done many spacecraft. And the, the labels that you see here are the places on Mars where we have landed spacecraft. And I'm going to tell you about a little bit of them. Again, this is a color-coded map. And so the blue areas are low. They are like a, a big valley. And the orange areas are, are high up in the mountains, in a way. Our first lander was in 1996, 45 years ago. And uh, this is a photograph taken. It's one of the first photographs from the surface of Mars. It's amazing. The, the rocks on Mars. Uh, are all those rocks that you see, most of them are volcanic. They all have a coating of orange dust on them. And um, uh, this orange dust is from rust. The iron in the rocks has become rusty over time. And that's what gives the surface its red color. From Earth, we see the surface of Mars as slightly reddish in color. And that's why it got the name Mars. Mars is the god of war in mythology. In, in Roman mythology. So this was our first look at the surface, and it's really amazing. And you know, to me, when I saw this photo for the first time, it looked very much like the American Southwest, Arizona or New Mexico, or I'm sure there are places in Mexico that look very similar to this. And so it was remarkable because it looks so much like the Earth. Then in 1997, we sent another spacecraft, and this one had a little rover. Right here, you can see it. It has rolled down this ramp and across the surface to study this rock. This was called Mars Pathfinder, another NASA mission. In 2004, we sent two spacecraft. Uh, these are much more sophisticated rovers. They were named Spirit and Opportunity. And they lasted a very long time on the surface of Mars. They made many discoveries. And I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but this is a photograph from Opportunity. These are the front wheels here on the sides. 
And you can see here, the arrow is pointing to this rock with some little de details there. And, and this is a close-up of that rock. And th the color is of these little pebbles. These are little round pebbles. They became, we, we called them blueberries. They're not really blueberries, but they look like blueberries. And what they are is uh, they are little, they're glued together bits of, of uh, matter that had to have formed in the presence of water. The, the blueberries contain a lot of iron oxide, a mineral called gutite and hematite that implies that there had to have been water in this location. Now, one of the places that Opportunity visited, it lasted for many years roving around the surface of Mars, is this crater called Victoria Crater. It's a little less than one kilometer across. You can see there are some sand dunes in the bottom of it. And I'm gonna enlarge this little square, uh, this little rectangle up here. And you can see these little streaks are the tracks in the ground of the rover Opportunity, which is right here perched on the edge of this, this beautiful crater. It had gone some distance to reach this crater. And then when it got there, it took amazing pictures. This is a photograph from that spacecraft of the wall of the crater. And you can see there are many layers here. Some of these layers are at different angles. These layers tell geologists that these layers had to have been not deposited by water, but by the wind. And so it, it uh, you know, when I look at this picture, it, it looks like I could be hiking in a canyon somewhere on Earth. It, Mars can be a very lifelike place. Now, in the meantime, NASA sent another spacecraft up here to near the North Pole. You might remember that there is water buried at both poles on Mars as ice down below the surface. So the Phoenix lander was to try to determine whether it could reach that frozen water underground. This is what the surface looked like when Phoenix landed. It's a very kind of flat surface, not a lot of terrain, no craters. But if you look closely, you can see that the surface is kind of undulating. There's a kind of waviness to it in a pattern. And we see this sometimes on Earth in areas very close to the poles. The ground freezes and then it, it thaws out and then it freezes again each year. And it creates this kind of same kind of textured pattern. So this is up in up in the, uh, near the, near Alaska. It's the kind of terrain that tells geologists that maybe there's a lot of water frozen as ice below the surface. And so the spacecraft landed. It used a rocket to to uh, slow its uh, descent. <clears throat> and when that rocket came near the surface, it blew away the dust. And this white area that you see here turns out to be a giant slab of ice. And it's probably ice that extends all the way out across that terrain I showed you. It's amazing that here, here just a few centimeters below the surface was the ice that Phoenix, the Phoenix lander was trying to find. It was right there all the time. So the lander had a, a, a kind of scoop. Let me back up just quickly and show you. It had a scoop right here where it could collect samples and then deposit it in instruments inside. And the scoop, after it scraped down just, a, just a, a, a few centimeters, you can see the white areas. This is ice, a bit of ice buried beneath the surface. The problem is that Mars is so cold that um, this ice is very, very hard. And it was too hard for the scoop uh, to get it and, and put it into, in for analysis. In a way, this, this particular spacecraft did not do its full mission because it could never get the ice inside its experiments uh, to be analyzed. Well, we've, we've come a long way in exploring Mars. These are, this is the rover from 90, 1997 down here at the bottom. These are the rovers from 2004 here on the left. And then this is a very large rover that NASA sent to Mars called, uh, it's called Curiosity. And it landed there uh, uh, nearly a decade ago. It's so heavy that it had to be 
rocketed to the surface uh, by this very powerful machine so that it wouldn't crash. This is the, the rover here uh, uh, folded up and getting ready to deploy. NASA decided to land this rover to land Curiosity in a large crater called Gale. And the reason for doing that is that Gale uh, has features in it that, that tell scientists that at some point in its past, there had to have been a lot of water. The inside of this crater was a giant lake. And yet in the middle of this giant lake, somehow this is again a color-coded map. So the blues are low and the oranges are high. Somehow in the middle of this lake formed a giant mountain. And that mountain um, is create, it has been created with, with stacks of, of, um, of different layers. And the youngest stacks are on the top and the oldest stacks are on the bottom. Much like in the Grand Canyon, when you see all of different layers, it's telling you the history of that part of Mars. And so scientists think that by sending a rover here, they can start at the bottom and literally work their way up the slope of this giant mountain and find out about Martian history. Here's a close up from the spacecraft of that mountain in the middle. It's called Mount Sharp. And the name Sharp comes from a, the, the surname, the, the family name of a scientist named Robert Sharp, who was a geologist who studied the planets back in the 1970s. Uh, I actually knew Bob Sharp, Robert Sharp. I took classes from him in college. Uh, and he was a great influence on, on my life and on my career. So one of the things that Curiosity found when it landed on Mars was a lot of textures in the surface that looked an awful lot like Earth. This is a kind of quiz for you watching this presentation. One of these pictures is of the Earth and the other one is of the planet Mars. Can you tell which one is which? Mars is on the left and Earth is on the right. This is what we call a uh, conglomerate. It is a place where there are a lot of small pebbles that have been loosely bound together by dirt and soil in a water environment. This is a picture of a selfie, if you will, of the Curiosity spacecraft. It has an arm, and so it sticks that arm out with the camera on the end and sort of leans back and takes its, its own picture, much as you would uh, here on Earth taking a selfie. And here in the background is that Mount Sharp, the, the big mountain in the center of the crater. And over here, this is the very distant edge of the crater, the rim of the crater. It's a very lifelike picture. And, and again, it looks a lot like places on the Earth that you've all probably visited. Well, Curiosity is still doing its work. Uh, this is a picture taken about two years ago of clouds in the atmosphere of Mars. These are ice clouds uh, made from water ice. The atmosphere is very cold, so it never rains on Mars now. The only water that is on the surface is in the form of ice. Even in the atmosphere, it's in the form of ice. So this close uh, uh, passage of Earth and Mars happened again about three years ago in 2018. And this is a time when Mars is especially close to the sun. And if you remember from earlier, it's a time when these dust storms can uh, be triggered that that encompass a lot of a lot of the surface. This is actually a photograph taken by an amateur astronomer, maybe somebody like you with a telescope who took a picture of Mars and this little bright area here is the beginning of a dust storm on the surface in May of 2018. And this little animation, the orange here is showing how the dust storm over time got more and more uh, extensive. And then unfortunately, you can see right here in the middle of where the dust storm was the thickest was the, was the rover Opportunity. And so Opportunity is a rover that uses solar cells to collect sunlight for the power that it needs to uh, operate its instruments and communicate with Earth and rove around on the surface. This dust storm blocked the sunlight. And so Opportunity didn't have the opportunity to, to collect any power. And because Mars is so cold, that power is also used to keep the spacecraft warm at night. So as the dust storm subsided, 
this is this is how extensive it got. The, again, these are two pictures of the, of Mars. Now, by you know, about three months later, the dust storm has gotten uh, quiet. The dust has settled. Again, here is the Hellas Basin that we've seen before, and so astronomers were hoping to reestablish communication with the Opportunity rover, but they never did. They these were the last pictures that we received from Opportunity. It got too weak and it died. After being on the surface of Mars for 14 years, because it landed in early 2004, it operated for 14 years. I've had many automobiles that haven't lasted 14 years. And here's a spacecraft that landed on Mars under very extreme conditions and survived for a long time. Well, okay. We've studied Mars with all kinds of different spacecraft. And here's one that landed there about the time that Opportunity died. It's called INSIGHT. And that word INSIGHT is actually an acronym. It's a shortcut for this very long name. <clears throat> the point here is that INSIGHT has no camera. It does not have wheels. Uh, it has no experiments uh, to analyze the soil. Instead, its only job is to be a geophysics uh, research station to see what is coming from the inside of the planet, whether it's heat or Mars quakes. Uh, and here is where InSight's landing site is, not far from where Curiosity is. And this is a, uh, a kind of a selfie uh, of the InSight lander taken uh, by its robotic arm. And uh, you can see the color of the surface. And so InSight has only two or three main instruments. One is a seismometer. This is to measure the surface for Mars quakes. That seismometer is covered by a kind of tent, a windscreen, because the winds on Mars, although the atmosphere is very thin, the winds cause uh, would cause the, the spacecraft and the instrument to vibrate. And that would be bad because then you wouldn't be able to tell whether it was a Mars quake or the wind. So the spacecraft put this kind of shield around, around the seismometer. And then one of the other experiments was a very interesting one. It was a, um, uh, think of it as a, as a uh, short stick with instruments on it that was to pose, supposed to burrow into the surface of Mars. They call it the mole after the little animal that makes burrows. And unfortunately, the mole didn't work very well. It, it, uh, it failed. It couldn't actually get into the surface. I'll mention that in a minute. But the other, the seismometer has been very successful in determining very faint Mars quakes. And these, these quakes on the surface of Mars aren't really formed the same way that we get earthquakes on the Earth. Maybe it's because something on the far side of Mars uh, was a collision with a, a small asteroid. Or maybe something is happening deep inside the planet that is causing uh, some kind of, of vibration. In any case, just like on Earth, this seismometer can detect these Mars quakes and use that information to determine what the inside of Mars, what the structure of the inside of Mars is like. And this is information that was just released a couple of months ago. Uh, InSight has been on the surface since 2018, so it's been there about three years. And in that time, it has studied a number of Mars quakes. And those Mars quakes have told scientists that the, the, uh, the structure of the inside of Mars is very similar to the Earth in some ways. There is a crust, a sort of a stiff outer layer there is, that is about 40 kilometers thick. There is a mantle, which is a hotter rock, deep down, still regular rock. And then in the center of Mars is a giant core of molten liquid, a giant liquid core on Mars that is about more than half of the diameter of the planet itself. Now, we knew that there was a core on Mars. We knew it was liquid. Uh, from our previous studies. But this is the first time we've had real detail. And it turns out that while the core itself is liquid, uh, there is no solid center to, to the planet Mars. Earth has a core that is liquid, but it has a solid uh, center, a solid ball, a giant ball of iron. 
Uh, this was that mole I was telling you about. It was supposed to drill down into the surface like that. It became stuck. The surface was too loose. And then fortunately, this is a, an experiment that, that, that actually failed. It never did what it was supposed to do, which is measure the heat coming out of the inside of Mars. That would have been very helpful to know. OK, well, our next Martian spacecraft has just recently landed on the planet. It's called Perseverance. It landed there last February. And it is a, a very sophisticated rover, much like Curiosity. And it carried with it a small helicopter, uh, the first ever helicopter on another planet. And so I think I have here, if you look right down here at the bottom, the helicopter right here, it's called Ingenuity. And this is its first flight. This is a little video showing its first flight on the surface of Mars. You'll see the propellers start to spin up there, and then it will jump off of the ground and hover. There it goes. The, the, this, this photograph is from the rover, Perseverance. It's spinning, it's staying put, and now it's going to land. Now, this is an amazing accomplishment because the atmosphere of Mars is very thin. No one knew if a helicopter like this could even fly. Maybe there wasn't enough air to make it possible for the helicopter to work, but it does work. And uh, Ingenuity has been uh, very, very successful. Now, Perseverance and Ingenuity landed in a crater called Jezero. That's where it is on the surface of Mars. This is a close-up of the surface of Mars. And this is a little bit complicated. This is kind of geologist talk here. Here is the rim of the crater. Here is a place in the crater wall where water has flowed in like a torrent, like a giant waterfall rushing in, flooding the inside of the crater. And all of this material here that you see is debris, is dirt and soil that was carried by the water and deposited on the uh, on the uh, a floor of the crater. Scientists think that if, if there was ever any life on Mars, the evidence for that, the organic material, might be concentrated in these deposits. And so that's why they set down the spacecraft inside this crater and it, and it landed inside this yellow circle. It's right about here. And so here are, here are some pictures of um, the, the uh, spacecraft, uh, pictures taken of the surface of Mars. And one of its tasks is to drill samples into rocks, to actually drill into rocks and create samples like this. So here is an actual rock on Mars that the spacecraft has drilled a hole in. And the result is a kind of tube full of material from Mars. The goal here is to take that material and collect it. Here's a, uh, this is an artist painting. Here's the Perseverance spacecraft. And this is a future spacecraft to be launched by the Europeans. They're going to take some of these samples and make a pile <laughs> at, at some location on the surface of Mars. And then at some point in the future, we haven't built this spacecraft yet, but the plan is for another spacecraft to land and pick up these samples that have been collected by the spacecraft and bring them back to Earth so that we can study them. This will probably happen within the next 10 years. It's going to be very exciting. Well, I've talked a lot about NASA, the American Space Agency, but NASA is not the only, uh, uh, the United States is not the only country that has sent spacecraft to Mars. Just within the last six months, this is a rover uh, that has landed on Mars. It's a photograph of the rover on Mars called Zhurong, and it's was landed by the Chinese, the Chinese space program. And much like our other rovers, it has big panels to collect sunlight and it has a mast. And these two little eyes that you see here are actually cameras that take pictures of the surface of Mars. So that spacecraft is there right now. You can see the little Chinese flag over here uh, on, the, on the, uh, the landing craft. And that, that rover is active right now. Now in a couple of years, the Europeans are going to send a rover to the surface of Mars. It's going to be called Rosalind Franklin. That's the name of a woman who was a scientist. She's now dead, but she was very instrumental in the study of DNA. 
And so if we hope to find life on Mars, we're probably not going to find actual uh, creatures, organisms, but we might find evidence that they existed as organic matter. And so this rover will be very, uh, very well equipped to make studies of organic matter on the surface of Mars. It won't get there yet. It won't get there for a couple of years. Because we really want to find out what happened to Mars. You remember seeing this picture earlier in this talk. Mars used to be a pretty nice place. There was water on the surface. The atmosphere was thicker. The temperature was warmer. It wasn't nearly so cold. It could have been a place where life developed. Not now, it's too cold, it's too harsh. So why did Mars change? Why did it become as cold and bleak as it, as it is now? Did it once look like this? A place with you know, large bodies of water and pretty clouds in the sky? Who knows, we're trying to figure that out. And, and uh, uh, the clues are very difficult to, to understand. We know that at some point in the past, Mars was a magnetic planet. It had a, a magnetic field, just as the Earth has a magnetic field. You know, when you use a compass on the Earth, it points toward north or south, depending on which hemisphere you're in, because of the magnetism that the Earth has. And so Mars did have magnetism at one time, but it doesn't have it anymore. It disappeared. And when that happened, no longer did Mars have a kind of magnetic shield to protect it from radiation from outer space. And so for lots of reasons, what Mars had a thicker atmosphere at one time, but because it's kind of unprotected, over billions of years, the, the, those gases in the atmosphere of Mars have been stripped away, almost all of them. And there's very little atmosphere left in the surface of Mars today. But something interesting must be happening there. I use the term a smoking gun. You know, when you fire a gun, you might not see the bullet, but the barrel of the gun is still smoking after you fire it. And it tells you that there must have been a bullet at some point. Well, we use that term in English to, to describe what we're seeing on Mars. We can see using sensitive instruments on the Earth that there are places on Mars indicated by red here that are leaking a gas called methane, natural gas. And methane should not exist on Mars. It's chemically uh, incompatible. It, it can't exist there. And so the fact that we see this methane on the surface of Mars is telling scientists that the methane must be being created now from inside the planet and escaping into the atmosphere. And so we're wondering how that can possibly be. Now, there are a lot of possibilities. Here's the methane molecule here in the second. It's a combination of carbon and four hydrogen atoms. It's one of the simplest organic molecules. It's actually very common on the Earth. Uh, it's, it's natural gas. Um, it's it's a, a byproduct of, of, of the existence of, of biology on the Earth. When, when a plant rots in the ground, it gives off methane gas. When a, when a cow eats grass and then gets rid of the, the grass, it gives off methane. Uh, so there, there are a lot of biological reasons why methane might be in the, in the atmosphere of Mars. And the question that we have to answer is, is it really methane that's being created by some kind of biology? There are a lot of ways that it can't be due to biology, and we'll find out eventually. So we have a lot of spacecraft that are studying Mars right now. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a joke, Mars attacked. There was a funny movie that some of you might have seen that, that was called Mars Attacks. It was aliens from Mars who came and uh, attacked the Earth. So it's a little play on words. But right now, at this moment, there are eight different spacecraft that are orbiting Mars. Not all of them are from NASA, three of them are. But one is from Europe, one is from India, one is from the Russians, Roscosmos, one is from China, and one of the, uh, the last one to arrive is from the uh, Arab uh, Emirates uh, in collaboration with the University of Colorado. These are all spacecraft right now around Mars that are taking pictures and recording other data. 
And there are five spacecraft on the surface that are working to study the planet. Uh, Curiosity, Insight, we, we've talked about all of these uh, in, in this presentation. So Mars is getting a lot of attention and it's going to get more attention uh, in the next couple of years. In 2023, two more spacecraft are due to land on its surface. Now, we spent a lot of energy trying to get to Mars and to understand its surface, but it turns out we didn't realize it until fairly recently that Mars is actually coming to us. There are meteorites that have fallen onto the Earth that were blasted off of the surface of Mars by, by powerful collisions. When an asteroid hits the planet Mars, it sends off a lot of debris, and some of that debris escapes into space, and some of it eventually lands on the Earth. And we can tell that this material is from Mars because the composition matches what our spacecraft have shown us is the composition of the surface of Mars. And this is one of those meteorites. The little cube down here in the corner, this is one centimeter on a side. So this rock is maybe you know, 15 centimeters long, and uh, it weighs a couple of kilograms. And it was discovered in Antarctica, actually. Uh, it stood out against the ice of Antarctica. And when scientists looked inside, they saw some very unusual things. For example, these little brown patches with the black and white rings around them are a mineral called carbonate. Now, carbonate is very common on the Earth. And apparently, it's very common on Mars, too. Usually, carbonate, an example of, of carbonate on Earth is a seashell. A seashell is something that was created by an organism. And so the question is, why is this carbonate here? And, and that, it, that was just one line of evidence. Then when they took a very powerful microscope and looked at the inside of this meteorite, they saw these little squiggly things, which are not alive now, but boy, they sure look like worms, don't they? And these might be little fossils of extremely tiny uh, microscopic organisms on the inside of this rock. So the question is, was it really life? It was a very, uh, this was, this analysis that I'm showing you here was done in the uh, 1990s. And this is the, the press release of the NASA scientists, they're sitting here. There's the, the meteorite right here on the table under the glass case. And look at all the reporters and cameras and TV crews. This was an enormously uh, exciting announcement that perhaps we had found in this rock evidence uh, for past life, fossil life. Now, in the years since then, there have been a lot of reasons to believe that that was not really true, that it was a false alarm that the rock really does not have any fossils in it, uh, and that we were being fooled in different ways scientifically. But I know for sure that we will realize that there is life on Mars when some astronomer someday looks through a telescope and discovers that there is a Starbucks on the surface of Mars. And then we will finally have proof. That's a little joke to end my presentation. I wanna thank you all for coming. I hope you've learned something. And now I think we're going to have some questions. Thank you for this great talk. I'd like to uh, read you some of the comments we have received so far from different social medias, from the local planetarium. Eh, Kelly, muchas gracias. Y por supuesto, queremos preguntas. Y voy a leerte algunos de los comentarios que hemos recibido de las redes sociales, tanto de Tribu como del Planetario Lunaria. And some of them send their greetings. For example, uh, there is, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong button. I'm pressing, okay. There is, Paola says, I really don't have questions. Paola dice, no tengo preguntas porque la, clara, la charla fue demasiado clara. I really don't have any questions, given the fact that your talk has been so clear. Interesting. Then we also have greetings. Gracias. From <laughs> Jacqueline Janis, um, yes, thank you very much. Jacqueline Janis dice muchas gracias. Rick Hunter says, great conference. Rick Hunter, muchas gracias, saludos. Um, Carlos de Jesús, okay, here's a question. Carlos de Jesús wants to know. Carlos de Jesús quiere saber, 
¿Cuál es la probabilidad de encontrar materia orgánica en Marte? What, is, what are the chances to find organic matter in Mar Mars? Okay. So, right now, the surface of Mars is very cold and very dangerous for even the simple uh, microbes that we have on Earth. Uh, the, the atmosphere is very thin, and so a lot of radiation from space and ultraviolet rays from the sun bombard the surface constantly. Maybe translate that part? Yes. Eh, dice Kelly que es muy peligroso vivir en la superficie de Marte porque está sujeta a un bombardeo constante de meteoritos debido a la escasez de atmósfera. So, an, or, an organism on the surface uh, would, would very quickly die and the, this radiation and the ultraviolet rays would break down the organic uh, molecules so that we can't detect them. También nos menciona que un organismo en la superficie moriría muy rápido, pero además sería desintegrado muy rápido también debido a la radiación a la que está expuesto de nuevo por una falta de atmósfera. So the hope is to go someplace on Mars where perhaps life existed or where organic material was concentrated. And that's where Perseverance is right now. It's in the bottom of a crater with lots of layers of sediment that have been washed in, in the hope of, of discovering some organic material that has been buried and protected over time. Eso es muy interesante. Nos dice Kelly que por eso las misiones están diseñando para ir a lugares en donde se han identificado diferentes capas que eso pudiese permitir que alguna materia orgánica pueda haber quedado protegida entre ellas y poderla así analizar. It's interesting that we have not sent an experiment to Mars to actually search for biology for organisms since 1976. In two years, that was, that was the Viking spacecraft. And in two years, there will be a rover. I showed a picture, Rosalind Franklin, that again will specifically test for organic matter. Wait, 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 wait. Um, this is quite something. Nos dice Kelly que es interesante que desde 1976 no se había enviado una sonda para hacer un experimento en búsqueda de biología a Marte. Pero eso va a cambiar dentro de dos años con la nave que va a enviar ESA, la Agencia Espacial Europea, llamada Rosalinda, que es precisamente ese el objetivo que tiene. That's it. That's, that's the end. Thank you. Muy buena pregunta. Muchas gracias. And thank you, Kelly, for your great answer. We have, I mean, questions have been rising. Yara Mendoza dice, dice mi hijo Esteban de 10 años, ¿cuál es la probabilidad de colonizar Marte en un futuro cercano? Interesting. Uh, Mrs. Yara Mendoza says, my kid, uh, who has just 10 years old, is asking, what are the chances to colonize Mars in the near future? Uh, an excellent question, whether you're 10 years old or 60 years old. Wait, wait, wait. Una pregunta excelente, ya sea que tengas 10 años o 16 o 60 años. And whether you're just starting school or, or you are a professional scientist. Y ya sea que apenas estés comenzando en la escuela o seas un científico profesional. Mars is very difficult to reach with just a robotic spacecraft, and it is very much more difficult to imagine sending humans there. Es muy difícil hacer llegar una sonda robótica a Marte, y es aún mucho más difícil pensar en hacer llegar seres humanos al planeta. It takes at least six to nine months to reach Mars. And so if you were an astronaut going to Mars, you would be, you know, weightless for all of that time until you landed and your body would be weakened from being in no gravity for so long. And then suddenly you have to land and function and do your work as soon as you arrive. Toma más o menos entre seis a nueve meses llegar a Marte. Y en todo ese viaje no estarías experimentando la gravedad. 
Por lo tanto, tu cuerpo se estaría debilitando. Pero una vez que hayas llegado al planeta, de nuevo estarías influido por la gravedad del lugar y tendrías que comenzar a trabajar. The famous uh, person Elon Musk and his company SpaceX have a plan to send people to Mars, uh, perhaps within a decade. And it's amazing to me that here we are in the 21st century and space travel is no longer conducted by governments. It can be done by one person with enough money to have their own space program. Interesante. Menciona que el que eh, la, el personaje famoso del cual todos hemos escuchado, Elon Musk, tiene planes precisamente para hacer llegar al ser humano al planeta Marte. Y él admira que al día de hoy estos proyectos tan grandes no son conducidos por gobiernos, sino de hecho por personas particulares, por supuesto, con suficiente recurso para llevarlo a cabo. Uh, you know, it's such a challenging, it, I'm sorry, if you think about the Apollo missions that went to the moon, a trip to Mars would be 10 times more difficult, 10 times more expensive. And so does someone have the, um, the enthusiasm, the, the political will to build the spacecraft that will be necessary? I don't think it will be possible in my lifetime So we'll have to all go watch the, the, the movie called The Martian. Eh, menciona Kelly que así como las sondas Apolo que se enviaron a la Luna, pues enviar una tripulación al planeta Marte sería más de 10 veces más difícil, complicado y requiriendo más recursos. Menciona Kelly que él considera que tal vez bien, él no lo va a, a, a alcanzar a ver en el tiempo que que siga en este planeta, pero nos recomienda a todos ir a ver la película de The Martian, actually. And that movie, if you have not seen it, is a very good movie to show the difficulty of trying to survive on the surface of Mars. Y esa, y esa película, en caso que no la hayan visto, nos muestra precisamente la dificultad de, que implicaría vivir en la superficie de Marte. Thank you. And, Sorry, yes, yes, please. And, and yet, uh, there was a company called Mars One that looked for volunteers to go to Mars just one way, never to return to the Earth. And they had many, many people volunteer for that, uh, that, that possibility. Can you imagine volunteering to leave the Earth and never come back? Y existe una empresa, se llama Mars One, que precisamente eh, lanzó una convocatoria buscando voluntarios que quieran ir en viaje solo de ida a Marte. ¿Se imaginan ustedes? Abandonando la Tierra para ir a vivir al planeta Marte. Thank you very much, Kelly. As you may read, we have tons of questions. I'm not going to tell you so much time. No voy a, vamos a tomar mucho de tu tiempo, pero quisiéramos leer varias de las que nos han llegado en principio. Y nos menciona... Paola Contreras, Paola Contreras is asking, ¿por qué puedes asegurar que no es compatible en mar, el gas metano con Marte? Interesting. Uh, she's asking, why are you saying that methane is not compatible with, on Mars? Okay. So also methane is not compatible on the Earth uh, because it, it reacts, it combines chemically with oxygen. And so our planet should not have any methane in its atmosphere at all. And so the fact that we do have methane is a sign, is, a, is evidence that there is life on Earth that is constantly creating more methane and injecting it into our atmosphere. Okay. Kenny menciona que en el caso de la Tierra, bueno, de hecho, químicamente el metano es un gas muy inestable y está reaccionando todo el tiempo con el oxígeno. De hecho, lo que hace que haya tanto metano en el planeta Tierra, principalmente es porque hay seres vivos que lo están produciendo constantemente. And the same situation exists on Mars. 
if we see methane in the atmosphere of Mars, especially if it's from one location, as seems to be the case from our, from our studies, then you have to wonder what is creating that methane. Uh, is it biology or some other process that we don't understand? El momento de encontrarlo en Marte, pues es la misma situación y hay que preguntarnos a qué se debe que existe tanta cantidad de metano en ese planeta. ¿Qué lo está produciendo? ¿Es producto de seres vivos o alguna otra cuestión? Okay. Interesting. Gracias, Kelly. Thank you. And there is another one. Ana Cecilia is asking. Ana Cecilia pregunta. Okay, this is quite interesting. ¿Cómo se imagina la vida en Marte en alguna era pasada? Thinking about uh, the chance that there had been life uh, so many years ago. How do you imagine that kind of life living on Mars? Well, you know, Mars is a planet very much like the Earth, as I think you've discovered from watching this. And so, if there was water on the surface, because we, we believe water is essential for all life, uh, then I can imagine Mars developing primitive life, maybe bacteria or, or single cell organisms and maybe it never got any farther than that so if we were to discover evidence for life on mars maybe it's nothing more than like a dark stain in a rock that is where the decaying uh organisms uh were billions of years ago a, a la evidencia que hay de que pudo haber existido agua en la superficie del planeta, tal vez la vida que eh, en mente tienen que estarían tratando de investigar no es lo mismo que la vida que, que conocemos en la Tierra, sino más bien seres eh, microcelulares y tal vez esperan una pequeña y delgada capa oscura que sea el registro precisamente de esa vida que hubiese existido en el planeta Marte. Right, Kelly? Yes. So, so here on the Earth, for example, our Earth is four and one half billion years old. And we have had life on Earth for nearly four billion years. But for almost all of that time, the only life that existed on our planet was one cell organism. A ver, menciona Kelly que aquí en la Tierra más o menos lleva de existir como 4,500 millones de años y al parecer solo durante los últimos 4 millones de años ha existido vida. Y en la mayor parte de ese tiempo, la vida que ha existido precisamente ha sido de seres eh, microcelulares. And so when we imagine life on Mars or life on some other place wherever it is, we need to remember that it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, human beings who have teleconferences by Zoom and send spacecraft to other planets. Maybe there are planets that are just completely covered with life, and all of that life is just bacteria. Menciona Kelly que entonces cuando pensamos en vida en otros planetas, posiblemente, pues no se está hablando precisamente de seres macrocelulares. Eh, inteligentes que puedan estar teniendo charlas eh, con estas herramientas de la tecnología actual. Probablemente la mayor parte de vida que pudiese existir precisamente sería en ese, en ese nivel celular. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, before we leave, we'd like to say hi. Antes de que nos vayamos, nos gustaría mucho saludar a las personas que amablemente nos han enviado eh, su presencia. María Luisa Montaño, hi, Paola Contreras, hi, uh, Yara Mendoza, Carlos de Jesús, Adrián Ábalos, Ana Cecilia, Rick Hunter, Juan Gerardo Guzmán, Adriana Lisset, Humberto Robledo, Jair Ibarra, Enrique Tusein, Nayeli Itzel, Alejandra Alcalá, Marisela Contreras, Laura Vázquez, Patti Santos y muchos otros. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Thank you all very much and thank you, Kelly, for your kindness. Gracias, Kelly por tu generosidad y tu amabilidad. 
y espero que sea la primera de muchas charlas más. I really hope this to be the first of so many talks, talks to have with you. Y a las personas que nos están viendo, una recomendación, si no la conocen, vayan a, eh, por su revista Sky and Telescope, tal vez la revista de astronomía más importante del planeta. En el número de octubre tienen un artículo muy interesante acerca de la relación de lo que eh, pudo haber caído en el planeta y la extinción de los dinosaurios. For those of you who don't know the Sky and Telescope magazine yet, maybe the, the best astronomy magazine in the entire world, the new, the new, the, the, the new volume for October has several tons of interesting articles in it. Les recomiendo que vayan y lo encuentren. Y de nuevo, muchas gracias por estar aquí y espero que sigamos este diálogo astronómico. Hasta luego y cielos claros. Clear skies, Kelly. Clear skies. Gracias. Y uh, hasta luego. Perfect. Are we done? Yes. Perfecto. How, how did you feel? That was a lot of fun. Let's do it again. Yeah. Maybe we could talk. Maybe we could talk about. Um, is there life elsewhere? Interesting. Actually, if, if I may, let me send you the video of the talk we had last Friday. Was from Norberto Alvarez. He was part of the group. I'm sure you have heard about that experiment. Yes. In Arizona Desert. And his talk was about designing and developing human habitats all out of this planet. Right. Yes, you right. shouldn't meet him. And by the way, I'm going to send you an email sharing your, your email with Vicente Hernandez. Remember, he is the director of the planetarium at Quintana Roo. Right. Should, he may be, and this is for sure, most important astronomy divulger in the entire country. And it's quite wow. a nice, such a nice guy. Yes, he is. And the last question, Kelly, I'd like to ask you, what telescope does Kelly BT actually use? Ah, a great question. Um, and so uh, let me ask you, what is your favorite pair of shoes? <laughs> Who says I just have one? Is that your answer? Yes, that's right. And so I, I have I have a lot of telescopes, perhaps 10, and Ooh. I use them for different for different purposes. We we have a saying that your favorite telescope is the one you use most often, that is the easiest to use. And I have a telescope that is a um, it's a reflector. It has a mirror that is 130 millimeters across, five inches. Interesting. And the, it's F5. It's about this long, uh, this long, <laughs> right? And uh, it's, it's very easy to use. It's on a very simple mount. And if I just want to go see something quickly, like uh, the moon or, or Jupiter or something like that, it takes me 30 seconds to set it down and start using it. So that is my favorite telescope. Let me confess you something. We earned a public grant, so we had enough resources to buy our first collection. And oh, our I like those binoculars. The binoculars, yes. Those are an overwear 20 by 65. Yes. Our favorite toy so far. Yes. We'll about a 100 millimeter Skywatcher ED. In Apple, yes. And a 12 inches Dobsonian from Orion. Right. And Fabulous. We haven't had the chance to use them at first because they went the, the of the clothes. Yes, that happens. Right, <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's a that's that's a great start. 